Okay. All right. We are at the top of the hour, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everybody. Nice to see you. Good evening. Um, my name is Kristen Jones. I'm the Director of Operations here at AFSPET, and I am joined by Dr. Natalie Marks. Today, we're talking about um, how to make your home a kingdom for your cat. Um, so if you have questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the chat box or <laughs> Um, we've got a fairly small group tonight. Feel free to ask them out loud. Uh, we'd love to have a conversation about everything. So um, with that being said, Dr. Marks, I'm going to hand it over to you. Sounds good. So tonight, um, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is how do we let our little tabby cat here become the lioness that she wanted to be <laughs> in her own home. And the reason that's important to veterinarians like myself, but also should be important to every cat mom and dad out there is because to be honest, the number one reason that cats don't stay in homes is actually a lot of behavioral changes that cats are showing us that to us make them <clears throat> appear unlivable but what they're actually trying to tell us is that something about our home is not set up to allow them to feel as comfortable as they could be. So tonight I've got five pretty easy steps to remember inside your home that allow cats to feel as comfortable being a cat as they can. Because we have to remember inside they are little predators. They are, again, trying to live out their dream of being a lioness or a lion uh, you know, out on the savanna, but instead they might be stuck in a one bedroom apartment and we're trying to simulate what they would do out there inside and allow them to be physically and emotionally healthy. And that's the most important thing of tonight. So we're going to talk about five different things to me, which are sort of the cornerstones for cats to feel as happy as this guy does right here. First is we'll talk about not forgetting vertical spaces. As humans, we tend to live horizontally, but cats live vertically. So we have to shift our frame of mind a little bit. Um, the second is understanding that they do need, need, and that's the capital N-E-E-D. They need to scratch. We can't get mad at them for choosing inappropriate things if we're not giving them appropriate settings for that. Uh, talk about how they like to eat. And yes, they do like to be fed all day long. That might not be something everyone can do, but we'll give some tri tricks on how to do that. Uh, toilets are incredibly important to cats, as they are to most people too, um, but especially the setup of those. And we aren't the only ones who need personal space. Cats definitely like their time alone, and they tell us when they need that. So we'll give you some tips on how to recognize that. So the first thing, <clears throat> don't forget the vertical space. I think this picture is one of my favorites because it sort of shows how a cat really wants to live in your home. And that's higher than you. <laughs> this is where a cat feels best, is surveying their kingdom, again, maybe your living room, and making sure that they know what's going on and that they are safe and in control. And that's, again, as you see them reaching out to their mom or dad here, um, that's where they feel happiest and they can relax. So if we've set up our home only thinking of the horizontal spaces, so all of their beds and toys and litter box and food is on the floor. That's actually a pretty vulnerable place for cats, especially cats in a multi-cat household, because their territories don't just extend on our tile or our carpet. They extend, again, vertically. And in fact, <clears throat> they, if in a perfect world, they can have territories that sort of co-mingle where they can have things that really engage them. Like, again, you see this home has built a shelf that sits on the sill off of the floor where cats can look outside and certainly see engagement from birds and maybe other cats and um, survey their kingdom, but again, also be off of the ground. This shelf I really like too, because it sort of doubles as a scratching cat. As you can see, it's carpeted and I envision that cats probably go there and do some happy scratching from time to time. Most of the time though, when we're talking about vertical spaces, you'll hear a lot of people refer to cat trees. And really all that is, is a very kind of standard post where there are ledges or beds, or in this case, you'll see uh, the sisal wrapping around, which is a very common texture for scratching posts. And a lot of cats um, really prefer to do a, a majority of their time um, around the cat tree. 
So many cats prefer to eat in their cat tree and sleep in their cat tree. And again, survey from their cat tree or escape another cat from their cat tree. Um, the thing to remember, especially with these, is that a lot of these cats, even though as we can see here where there's multiple cats on a cat tree, a lot of these cats do prefer to have their own. What is thought by behaviorists is that cats have a territory of about six feet around them at minimum. So if you think about a cat tree and kind of draw a circle six feet around, most of the cats are not gonna allow another house cat to, or a dog for that matter, to come into their territory, territory without some kind of interaction. Now that may be a subtle look, that might be a vocalization, it might be an all out kind of brawl or um, engagement. But when we only have one cat tree for three or four cats in a home, Unfortunately, what that does is it lends itself con to continue debate over whose cat tree that is and whose territory that is. And that can lend itself, as you can imagine, to a lot of disgruntled interactions, which are very stressful for parents too to watch. So again, even though these cats are certainly sharing their tree and seem incredibly relaxed and sleepy, they might have grown up together and this is what they know, but most cats do prefer to have their own scratching post and scratching tree where they have a vertical space for escape. You can even go as far as this, which is probably one of my favorite cat trees of all time, this mystical Alice in Wonderland cat tree that a family has created for their home. Um, I can't even imagine how happy these cats are in here. Um, but you, again, a lot of people have, a, have their DIY cat trees and you know after this, um, Kristen, I probably will send you maybe some DIY that we can post in the clubhouse for anyone who's interested in some of their um, home projects and creating some spaces like this. But <clears throat> you, they can be as simple or as elaborate as you want them to be. And the most important thing, again, is for there to be some place to scratch and also a vertical space of escape. Second thing, we're going to kind of go back to the scratching, but I want to talk a little bit more about these, um, is the social distances. So what I mean by that is, and you can see this little kitten is sort of learning how to scratch on this sisal post. When we think about how much space a cat really needs, I think there's a little bit of a misconception of, um, especially some newer pa pet parents who think that a cat, because they don't need to be walked or don't have some of the kind of social requirements a, a dog might have, that a cat doesn't need a ton of space and that it's a perfect um, pet for a very small studio or a dorm room or something like that. And it's not to say that we can't make that work because in the city where I'm at in downtown Chicago, there's a, quite a few families that live in very small spaces and have a really, really happy cat. But the interesting part about that is how we place things within that social space to make cats feel really happy. And I'm gonna keep stressing the placement because that's really one of the keys to the kingdom is where does the scratching post go in relationship to the litter box, in relationship to where this kitten's eating and relationship to where this cat is sleeping. The, the key is really the social distances, again, of one to three meters. That means that we don't place our litter box directly next to our food, directly next to our scratching post, directly next to the bed and line them up. I'll show an example of that in a minute. That is incredibly stressful to a cat. And although that might be in a small space, the only floor space that you have, that's why it's so important to think creatively about vertical spaces and also to think about using some of the corners or outer edges of your room. So a lot of times people will say to me, I'm in a studio, Dr. Marks, I just don't know where to put the box. Well, to me, the litter box has to be as far away from the food as possible. I'll explain why that is in a minute. It's the same with the scratching post though. Remember, cats have an innate need to scratch. Um, I am vehemently, as is the most of the veterinary profession, against declaw. The reason is, is well, lots of different reasons, but most importantly, um, this is a normal behavior of cats. They need to scratch. It's how they release energy. It's how they release pheromones, which are chemical compounds from some of the pads and interdigital spaces, so in between the toes, that allow them to mark this territory as theirs. They also need to scratch because that's how some cats also 
um, sort of communicate to other cats in the home. People get very discouraged when they bring home a new kitten and two to three weeks later, they come in to see me if they maybe haven't uh, set up their kingdom. And they say, you know, my leather couch is destroyed. The side of my armchair is destroyed. I'm at my wits end. I don't know what to do. And part of that, again, is not understanding this is a need of a cat and this is how we can set it up. Scratching posts can be very creative, just like those cat trees. So again, sisal rope is a very easy do-it-yourself scratching post. Just get a wooden spool and wrap this around and glue it. Cats will use this all day long. But there are also horizontal scratch pads, which are very popular, especially if you don't have a lot of room to have these beautiful vertical spaces. So these can work just as well. Sometimes though, cats need a little bit more training and incentive to come over to a horizontal scratch pad. And that can be done with catnip and some of the other chemo attractants. Um, there is a product called Fila Scratch. That's a little harder to get now, but is still available on some online sources. And that's basically a, again, a pheromone. So it's an attractant that you put on the scratching post and allows a cat to want to scratch there and get kind of trained to the scratching post. And again, one of my favorites, the Mona Lisa scratch pad. <laughs> you wanna get and, and make your scratching pads part of your artwork in your home, you can get just as creative. And many cats um, will, you'd be surprised at how vertically um, inclined they are to go up even to, to the rafters and on the ceilings to use some appropriate scratching places. So again, I encourage you to think more about the spacing and not be afraid to use vertical, or in this case, horizontal scratching posts but one per cat ideally, and again, understand that social distance. Now feeding cats. This is really where we pull that inner prey drive or what we call that prey activation out of our cats to keep them stimulated and emotionally healthy. So I'm gonna tell you something about really how cats wanna eat and many pet parents who I have worked with over the years look at me with eyes wide open and go, you are crazy, Dr. Marks. There's no way I'm gonna do this in my house. So I'm gonna tell you an, a, an ideal way, if you are retired, have a flexible schedule, if you really wanna try this on a weekend and see how it goes, but I'm also gonna tell you some modifications that we can do that really encourage sort of the same theory. In the wild, cats eat, they prefer to eat 10 to 20 times per day. So it's actually, if we think from a cat's perspective, it's actually kind of insulting when we put a bowl of food down once every three days and think that that's going to satisfy the mental stimulation of our cats in our home. Um, they look at that and go, you've got to be kidding me. They want to hunt. They want to find things. They want to exercise. And they are emotionally much happier if we can use their activation, that inner prey drive, and, and make them move around the house. So this is the Doc and Phoebe's um, feeding system, which is essentially 10 little mousers you see here with the kibble put inside of it. And the theory is, is that you take these little mousers and hide them around your house horizontally and vertically, and not just in one room, but kind of all over and all different levels, maybe on top of your fridge and on a windowsill and in a closet and on a table and wherever you can in the cat tree and let your cats find it and eat. This is a really fun way, number one, again, to kind of play games with your cat, but number two, to get easy exercise inside your home. Many pet parents today struggle with cats that are overweight and trying to get them to lose weight once they're there. Part of this is a workout for them. And so it sort of kills two birds with one stone, not to, not to use the pun here with cats. But the other thing that we want to remember about this feeding um, theory and system is that when we give them a deep bowl, and I'm going to show you sort of a reminiscent here, okay? When we give cats a deep bowl, what ends up happening is their whiskers end up eventually touching that bowl, right? Because the whiskers are incredible tactile sensories uh, for cats. And when those whiskers touch the bowl, they actually feel uncomfortable and end up what's called getting whisker fatigue. If they continue to touch that over and over, that actually places that cat at a disadvantage because of the whisker fatigue. And that doesn't make a cat feel good. We want to avoid 
having their whiskers touch anything again that has a rim or sort of the shelf around like a deep bowl. So using the no bowl feeding system, like I just showed you, so this mouser system, or even using plates or flat saucers or a very, very, very shallow lip on a bowl is much better than a deep bowl for a cat. So if you can't do the, the Doc and Phoebe system, the easiest thing to do then is to take your normal day, the normal amount of food, and instead of putting it down in just one bowl during the day, find little, little saucers, or you know what works really great is actually kids play saucers, they're about this big around, and divvy your cat's food up into six to eight or even 10 little teeny snacks and hide them around the house before you go to bed. And watch over the next few days, you'll, re you'll remember where you put them so they're not hidden forever. Um, but check over the next few days and see how your cat is doing, not just how they're eating, but also how they're acting. Most pet parents will report that after doing this style of feeding over a few days to a week, is that cats seem friendlier, they seem more active and more engaged in life. Because again, it's not just the physical nourishment they need, it's that mental stimulation. Now I put this up because it reminds me of a very important point about feeding cats. Cats are carnivores, absolutely true. They are very dependent, if not essentially dependent on protein and meat. However, there are certainly pet parents today that prefer to do a raw style of feeding, which is what this cat is doing here, eating raw meat off of a counter. As a veterinarian, what I just want to point out to that is this, in that feeding raw food and is a health risk for humans. And so if that is something that you're interested in doing, I'm not saying that it can't be done, but I strongly encourage you to talk to a care coach, talk to a veterinarian. There are even veterinary nutritionists out there that can help you do that safely because we still need a balance. In fact, there are several nutrition no-nos that I just wanna point out to cat moms and dads tonight that we really wanna stay away from from cats. Um, as I mentioned, as the carnivores that they are, they can't just eat meat. Feeding only meat will lead to nutritional deficiencies and those cats will get very sick, as will feeding large amounts of fish. So I'm talking 75% or more of their diet being fish. What ends up happening with that is they can get a lot of inflammation of their internal fat. So I kind of feeling my, <laughs> my love handles right now. All of that gets very inflamed. It's very painful and very hard for us to treat. So we want to stay away from that. Occasional fish, definitely okay. Adding in additional vitamin and mineral supplements are not necessary if you're feeding a balanced diet. So again, questions for that, definitely you want to direct to your veterinarian. Feeding foods with a very low pH. You may not even know if you're doing this, <clears throat> but very important if you have questions about your diet, again, to talk to your veterinarian because that low of a pH can actually disrupt their healthy urinary system. If you know anything about cats, when cats start going out of the litter box, it can become an incredibly hard challenge to fix sometimes. So we wanna avoid that as do we wanna avoid vegan diets. Again, so that's anything where we don't have a meat source. Remember they are obligate carnivores, which means it is essential to their life that they eat that way. The fourth thing, and this is actually one of my favorite things to talk about ever, because it's actually very, very little is talked about cat toilets, but it's such an important part of their life. The perfect litter box or the perfect cat toilet. Um, I will, I'm ashamed to say that many veterinarians don't talk about this and we should with every single cat mom and dad. Perfect litter box needs to be at least one and a half times the size of your cat from the tip of its nose to the tip of its tail. So looking at this box, this box is pretty small for the average cat. In fact, this to me would only be a box for a kitten. Cardinal rule of toilets and cats is it's a litter box per cat plus one. So yes, that means if we have six cats in a home, we need seven litter boxes. Again, just like when I'm telling people they should feed their cats 10 to 20 times a day, I typically get the, what? <laughs> yes, if you are in a studio apartment and you have six cats, you need to find a way for seven litter boxes in a perfect world. Um, so that's another way to kind of think about how we're shaping our home. Food and water need to be at least five feet away all the way around this litter box. 
Cats do not want to eat where they go to the bathroom and vice versa. This is a very common, just kind of, um, I would say domestic, it kind of innate hunting and, and prey predation um, tendency that all animals have. And so we wanna respect that and not put them next to each other. Unscented clumping litter is ideal and uncovered is ideal. Now I'm saying that again, ideal, because this does not mean that if you got a litter robot or a covered box or had two cats in one box that it's not going to work. It definitely can. But more often than not, we see the opposite, that there are several cats in a home and someone starts going out of the box and then we look at their kingdom and it's three cats, one box, food right next to each other. This box is too small. The cats can't do their dance and we end up with inappropriate urination. And very similar to this. So this is a household where there were three cats and they put out three boxes, great intention. But those cats said, whoa, um, cat number A said, um, cat B and C's toilet are in my territory. I'm not gonna go here. I'm gonna go find a piece of carpet. And cat B said, yeah, I'm, I'm not going over here. I'm not going next to these guys. I'm gonna go in your bed. Um, and then we end up with a very unhappy household, typically the humans more unhappy than the cats. Um, so this is incredibly important to remember, as is the size of the box. So cats have a dance in their litter box. Most people don't recognize this, but they have three very important and essential steps every time they go. So they have the pre-elimination dig. So a cat will go in and kind of set up their toilet and do this beautiful little dance of digging. Then they will posture and eliminate. And then they do a post elimination dig where they either bury or smooth or do whatever they're going to do to cover up what they've done. Cats need a depth of litter and space and privacy to be able to do this completely. And so with this box, you can see it's butted up against a wall. It's way too small. And this cat is probably not going to feel comfortable doing much other than laying in this box, let alone eliminating. Dr. Marks? Yes. We had a question come in. Sure. Um, Robin is asking why seven litter boxes for six cats? Why not six? What is yeah. that come for? It's such a great question. And I've asked that so many times to veterinary behaviorists. So the concept is, is that we always want an extra because territories change. Um, while dog territories, so there's typically an alpha dog in a home and then a beta and a gamma and sort of have a hierarchy. Cats actually become pretty dynamic territories um, when they're establishing, which means that they are fluctuating and changing. So if, let's say, an older cat has decided that the litter box in the bathroom is their territory, and then all of a sudden has claimed, you know, I don't, I don't want this one anymore, or a new cat came in and became more dominant and claimed that territory, you want to be able to give them an option. So from what behaviorists say is that we always wanna have an extra, sort of like you always wanna have a spare tire in your car because there's always the chance that there's a change in territory and it's much easier to keep cats in the litter boxes than to wait till they decide they don't want them anymore and try to get them back in. So again, it, I wish I had better reasoning in that, but that's sort of what's been explained to me is that because territories are changing so much, we wanna have that extra one always available, sort of that spare territory. So a cat chooses that rather than again, your bed or the, the couch or the carpet, and that becomes their new toilet. Very interesting. Yeah, of course. So we talked, um, last time when I was here, we talked about happy dogs versus stressed dogs. And it's, um, I wanna kind of go over the difference between a relaxed cat and a stressed cat. We'll start with the relaxed cat. So this, I mean, I, don't you just want to go up to this cat and just like nuzzle into him? He looks so happy. We have a soft forward facing face. Ears are forward. They can also be to the side a little bit, but typically forward. The pupils have that beautiful almond shape and the tail is away from the body with a very relaxed musculature. So you can envision that this cat is just sort of lounging. And if you picked this cat up, it would just be a lump of love. Now, we also unfortunately can see cats that are quite stressed. Now this is a fairly easy exaggeration of a stressed cat, mostly to give that contrast, but the reason that it's so important, we see unfortunately stressed cats that come to the veterinary office, but cats can get stressed in their own home. And that's where we end up with bites, scratches, and unfortunately bad interactions, where instead if we as parents 
can respect their body language, this is the time they need personal space. If a cat is hissing, if their lips are drawn back, if their ears are to the side, but mostly backwards, you see the difference in this cat's pupil, whereas the cat at the top has those kind of slits, um, the black part of their eye, the pupils, the cat at the bottom has those big black dilated pupils. The tail is tucked around the body and close to the body and the body's crouched and arched. This is a cat telling mom or dad or sister or brother or another cat in the household, leave me alone. I need space. Do not come near me. Cats are not fighters by nature. They're actually lovers by nature. So when a cat is at this stage of wanting to fight and defend itself, behaviorists say that this is the most fearful a cat can be. This is the highest level of fear and stress. So for us to attempt to interact with a cat at this stage of stress is wrong on our part and also sad to witness because we don't want cats to get to this level. So that's why it's incredibly important to interact with our cats when they are showing us the relaxed body language. So this cat probably laying in the sun, happy as a clam, right? Doing that beautiful little like biscuit move with the front feet and relaxed face and ears forward and the body is sort of like the feet are out to the side a little bit. This is a cat that when this cat would wake up, I would love to call over and we're doing cheek rubs and forehead rubs and you know belly rubs if they allow and interacting that way. Just as a kind of an aside, um, remember that an acupressure point for cats is right between, so if ears are here, right on the forehead, just above the space between the eyes. So gentle pressure on that spot actually will relax cats. And often when I'm working with cats in the clinic, I will do that gentle hold and you will see over time cats kind of just sort of sink down and relax. So if a cat's acting like this or does this on your lap, that's a really easy thing to practice and just see if your cat will relax that way. A really gentle, easy acupressure point. And remember that cats, again, they need their privacy and that could be as simple and as cheap as I think one of the cat's top five toys in life, the empty cardboard box. <laughs> if any of you are cat moms or dads, you understand that this is the most exciting thing since sliced bread, I would say for children too, um, but they love this. So it doesn't have to, these don't have to be super, super elaborate, expensive toys to give them space. Cats love hiding spaces. So turning a box over and cutting a little hole in the door and letting them have a little space like this will actually change the dynamic of that cat's body language very quickly. And starting young and giving each cat in the household their own private space is really, really important to their health. So just a quick review again. Vertical spaces, we think horizontally, but cats want the vertical spaces. So look around your home and find some areas where you can incorporate some cat spaces in those vertical places. Don't forget scratching posts are a need, not a want. Cats need to scratch, preferably one per cat, and we wanna have some space in between those. Feeding, feeding for a lioness, not our indoor cabbies. 10 to 20 times a day is a perfect entity, but attempt to get close. Spread it out and allow them to exercise and hunt and activate their inner prey drive that makes them emotionally healthy. Making sure that we give them the toilet they want in the right place that they want so they can do their dance and make sure they stay in the box. And then, as I mentioned, we want to be able to understand how they're communicating to us through their body language. So important to understand, not just for their emotional health, but also for the safety of everyone in that home. So Kristen, I'm gonna turn it over to you just for these next two slides. And then I think we have a giveaway as well. Yes, we do. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, thank you, Dr. Marks. This is really helpful. I, I wanted to ask you a question real quick. Um, Robin asked the question about plus one, if you have multiple right. cats, do you need two for one cat or is one litter box okay for one cat? You do need well, two. You should introduce two in a perfect world. Now I will say a lot of cat parents do that and then they come back and they go, my cats only use one box. <laughs> I told you so, I've got an extra box. What do I wanna do with it? Um, and I tell them, I'm glad that you did that because you never know. And then usually a month or two later or from some stressful thing, 
their cat starts using the other box. And it's typically a move or a new baby or a new pet or something stressful. And that cat wants to be able to have a separate space. So these litter boxes don't have to be in the center of your living room. Um, they can be, again, kind of in, in, you know, in conspicuous places around the house. They can even be in your bathroom as long as your food for them is not right next to it. Interesting. Okay, cool. I never, I did not know that. That is very cool. Um, okay, well, any questions from anyone else? Or thoughts or ideas? Uh, I did see someone on um, our team posted a little, she, she's going to post it in the clubhouse. It's a little tutorial on how to make a, a DIY scratching post Yay. Um, that you can on the wall. So that'll awesome. be coming out to the clubhouse soon. Awesome. Um, and then and whatever I guess, you can me. And maybe, put, maybe I can just say really quickly, Kristen, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. No, um, a lot of people say, well, I've made these scratching posts, but my cat is still scratching the couch or the side of my chair. What can I do to distract the cat from going there? So just keep a few of these products in mind because they actually are deterrents for cat scratching. So double-sided tape is a very easy thing to put down on top of your couch. Obviously you don't wanna sit there when it's down, but cats don't like that uh, as far as a scratching texture. The underside of a rug runner. So if you turn a rug runner over and it has those little bumps kind of on the bottom, uh, cats hate that. So putting that on top of a couch works really nice as does sandpaper. So for a lot of people, I tell them, a, a common um, destructive place for a lot of cats who don't have appropriate scratching posts is the side of leather couches. Because cats will walk around and they, they look at this beautiful leather and they're like, oh, my scratching post. And then they just destroy it. So if it's a vertical space, I'll tell people either put double-sided tape or Velcro, depending on what it is, and then attach a, a sheet of sandpaper. And you can go to Home Depot or Lowe's or any hardware store and just get it cut to the size. I mean, it's like two bucks, very, very cheap and put it on that space temporarily. Cats hate that. It's like nails on a chalkboard to a cat. So that is a quick way to distract them from going there. But at the same time, we want to continually bring them to their scratching posts. Again, catnip, other high reward treats and certainly pheromone therapy to attract them there will help if they don't wanna choose that, but they definitely will have more tendency to choose that if their kind of bad boy scratching voice post site is no longer available. So just to add that in there. That's awesome. Yeah, I think we can put some um, links to some of those products you mentioned, the Phila Scratch. Sure. And some of the other ones, we can find those links and put them in the clubhouse. So that'll Absolutely. be Absolutely. Awesome. Okay. So just to quickly run through this, um, I would just wanted to share with everyone, uh, what you get, um, with ask Vet and a membership. Um, part of what you're getting is what we're doing tonight. Uh, webinars exclusive with, um, Dr. Marks and other, uh, professionals in the veterinary industry. Um, and then you get access to the clubhouse too, where we post different things like the product links for things that might be helpful for you. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the DIY scratch posts, um, these little tips and tricks like Dr. Marks just mentioned. And um, also, we also will also, uh, you will also get a um, an, uh, membership to Pet Care RX, which you can get some of these things at a, at a much discounted rate. Um, so there's that as well. And then we send a welcome box with some diagnostics in there, some treats, some fun things like little catnip and toys. Um, and of course you have 24 seven access to our veterinarians and um, also get support from our care coaches. So we can create a special plan for your pet, um, for your cat to help you with some of these things. We're positioning all of your, um, your cat equipment, their scratching posts, their uh, horizontal scratch pads or litter boxes, their food, all of that stuff where we can meet by video and help you do that in your home. Yeah. Um, and then also we have the rainy day fund. So in the event that you do have to take your pet to the emergency room, um, we will be there to support you up to a thousand dollars in your rainy day fund that we can help with. Um, so I wanted to share that with you. And uh, Georgia Duncan is one of our <laughs> care coaches. She's on our webinar tonight. Everyone wave at Georgia. <laughs> um, and then lastly, wanted to invite you all to um, enter into our giveaway for a Kong cat toy. Um, so I'm going to put the link in the chat box right now. If you'd like to submit, uh, there's a few questions just to let us know how we did on the webinar today. 
And if you could just share with us a little bit about what's your biggest concern as a pet parent, um, we'd love to learn a little bit about you and um, be able to help you as well. So in these other- are wonderful toys for dogs and cats. Um, mm-hmm. Certainly there, there's a lot of flexibility in how you use those and we use them for all kinds of emotional and mental stimulation for our patients, even in the hospital, um, as well as just, of course, for fun engagement and specifically for cats. I love having these toys because it does encourage exercise and our indoor cats just do not get enough. So great giveaway tonight. Awesome. Yes. All right. Any other questions for us tonight? Okay, I'm not seeing anyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Marks, thank you. This was very enlightening. I learned a lot. (laughs) My pleasure. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Take care. You too. Bye. Thank you.